Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Christopher Plant and I am here representing Kismet Cowork. And we are doing our best to uh, stay busy and stay proactive during this crazy time. And Natalie and I have done a lot of work together over the years and we got together and decided to um, put together a series of webinars. We did a webinar last week uh, where we had uh, close to 100 participants and it was a big success and we, we had, had over a hundred participants yeah like 150 yeah so, so it was awesome and um and so that was um navigating ambiguity with design thinking and today we're going to be focusing on make a creativity leap um natalie as many of you know uh is with figure eight thinking and is an expert in many things but um in this time of great uncertainty i think it's um you know, she's got a fantastic viewpoint and, uh, and, a, and a great voice to hear. Uh, we will be recording this. Uh, we will be making uh, the recording available to everybody who's participated. Uh, Natalie will be sharing her slide deck. And, um, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited to, to build out this, this programming um, with, with, uh, with Kismet and with Figure Eight Thinking. So thank you very much, Natalie. And um, welcome, everybody, to our, uh, to our presentation today. Thank you so much, Christopher. Really happy to be here with everybody. Thank you so much, everyone, for taking some time out of your day to um, hopefully experience some inspiration and some paradigm shifting. So as Christopher said, we have worked together in various ways over the years. Christopher is not only the co-founder, oh, sorry, founder of uh, Kismet Coworking in Philly. He's also founder of Kismet Radio. They do awesome podcasts, so definitely check those out. So we're gonna get started. I will be sharing my slide deck and the recording will be posted on my YouTube channel. So definitely subscribe and um, let's get started. So hang on, let me first share my, my uh, screen. Okay. Okay, thanks. So um, yeah, so this is, uh, part two of um, a short webinar series. And as Christopher said, last week we were focused on design thinking and today on ways we can explore making creativity leaps. The reason why creativity is especially useful lens right now is because all of us are navigating intense amounts of ambiguity and uncertainty and from my perspective, uh, creativity is an amazing competency that we can all learn to exercise. And I, I have some thoughts about how to do that. Okay, so um, I wanted to start out with this image because in, in this time of COVID-19, we are all trying to recenter ourselves. I've heard several people describe every day waking up, working from home as um, uh, um, Groundhog Day, right? We don't have the same sorts of anchors in our day. We have to redesign our relationship with time and reorient ourselves. And so that's, that's the, the kind of um, more recent reason for, for exploring this idea of creativity. Uh, creativity as a way to reorient and reposition ourselves in these days of great ambiguity. But to give you a bit more context, the other reason why creativity is, is really top of mind for me is that in my consulting work, um, especially with corporate clients, I was observing even more poignantly for the past two years, a bit of what I would call innovation churn. And what I mean by that is so many of my clients in the healthcare space and, um, and media and, um, and consumer product goods are, are really focused very strongly and for good reason on building cultures of innovation. But um, I had the sinking sensation that we were all kind of talking over and around each other. And um, I got to a place where I realized, I think we should really be starting somewhere else. We shouldn't be starting at innovation and just kind of doing this kind of um, uh, groping in the dark way of building these cultures of innovation. We actually have to start 
with creativity. Uh, but the challenge, of course, is that there's a lot of misconceptions about creativity. You yourself may have said, oh, I'm not a creative type because you've only associated creativity with uh, the arts. And so I, this is um, a preview to a book I've, I've written uh, that comes out in June. And it's, it's an attempt, it's one contribution to thinking through how we can all exercise our creativity so that we can actually ultimately innovate because creativity is the engine for innovation. Um, the other kind of broader reason why creativity is going to be more and more essential is because of something we're now calling the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and so the fourth industrial revolution is something that we are currently in now. The train has left the station. So the fourth industrial revolution is a time when technology is ubiquitous. It's all around us. It's, it's in the form of AI, augmented reality, virtual reality, robotics. If you have an Alexa in your home, oops, I just said that out loud. I hope mine doesn't go off. Uh, but, um, you know, we are, we, technology is ubiquitous. What's interesting to me is that in the past three industrial revolutions, what has happened is that humans have had to merge in and morph into the technology. If we're talking about the industrial revolution, um, it was about morphing and, and seamlessly becoming intertwined with the factory machinery, right? And, and, and increasing efficiencies in that way. The opportunity now is to, to, to shift to um, a way where technology can amplify what is uniquely human about us. And if any of you watched the Super Bowl, there was one commercial during the Super Bowl, which I really loved, where it was um, a Google ad, a Google commercial. And it was an elderly gentleman who was asking uh, the Google equivalent to Alexa to remind him of the way his wife would um, smell uh, on a summer afternoon. Remind me of her favorite joke. Remind me of the first time um, we went out on a date. And I don't know about you, but if you saw that commercial, it really brought some tears to my eyes because it, it was an example of technology at its best, right? Of technology being used in a way to amplify what is uniquely human about us. Um, but to, to really take advantage of technology in a way that it is accentuating and making even mo better what it means to be human, um, I think we've got to make some creativity leaps. And that's what we're here to discuss today. So just as a preview, I'm going to have some question prompts throughout this webinar. And so it's going to be really important that you use the, the chat area. And Christopher is going to help us by reading out loud uh, some of the comments and responses that you put in. And that, and that way, we're, we're going to make this a bit more interactive. So stay ready for those questions. One of the things I've been doing is collecting what I would call signals on the landscape. And I have quite a few. I'm just going to share about three with you today. Um, the first signal on the landscape comes from the World Economic Forum. Um, back in 2015, the World Economic Forum predicted that creativity would be would rank as the number 10 job skill by 2020. That was that was five years ago, back in 2015. In 2016, one year later, they projected that creativity would rank as the number three top 10 job skills in 2020. And what's funny to me is that the job skills that ranked as number one and number two were skills such as problem solving and critical thinking. And I chuckle at that because problem solving and critical thinking are embedded in creativity. So net net, um, the World Economic Forum's uh, really predicting that creativity is gonna be something that we need to hone, that we need to practice and get really good at um, in this year and moving forward. And certainly COVID-19 pandemic is really showing us all the different ways we have to shift the ways we work, the way we connect on a human level, and the ways we develop ourselves personally. So that's one signal on the landscape. Some other signals that I could share with you include uh, things like when Larry Fink 
uh, who every January sends out a letter to CEOs of like the top Fortune 100 companies, um, and some that eventually that letter gets pub gets publicized. But you know these these companies uh, await Larry Fink's letter with bated breath because as the CEO and chairman of the board of one of, of maybe the largest uh, venture capital firm in the world, they they have about seven trillion. That's trillion with a T. Seven trillion assets. Seven trillion dollars worth of assets under management. So when you have that level of AUM and you speak. Um, people listen. And this January of 2020, Larry Fink, in his letter, proclaimed that sustainability would no longer be this optional metric that they would use to, to make decisions as, as part of criteria about whether or not they would invest in companies. Going forward, he, he declared that, that sustainability would absolutely be a determinant in whether or not they invested or divested from a company. And sustainability is environmental sustainability, uh, uh, triple bottom line, people, profit, and planet. So that's one more signal on the landscape that the way we need to start thinking about what is what we deem as creating and generating value is shifting. And creativity is one of the ways we can, we can make those decisions. Um, I also just want to point out that Sacha Nadella, who is the CEO of Microsoft, he uh, in his book that came out in 2017, he used the word soul in talking about Microsoft. And who would have thought that a, a major tech firm like Microsoft, the CEO would lead with something as human as the soul. So those are some other signals. But I love watching TV and TV has never been better. And here's another signal that I thought was super interesting. So you see on your screen um, images of, of um, two teenage characters. Uh, the, the young man on the left is Junior, and Junior is a character on the, the hit television show Blackish. And then on the right side is the character Abigail. And Abigail uh, is the character who's the daughter of Madeline. Madeline was played by Reese Witherspoon in the television show Big Little Lies. And what I thought was fascinating about both of these characters are these are uh, Gen Zers, Centennials, who have absolutely declared to their parents they have no intention of going to college. Uh, in the case of Junior, he wants to take a gap year. And in the case of Abigail, she has, has uh, told her, her, her parents that she has already gotten a job with a startup. Um, what's interesting to me about this, and, and, and keep in mind, just in full transparency, I'm a former university professor, so I worked in academia for over 16 years, and what's fascinating to me is we're seeing a shift among young people in really questioning the ROI uh, of our traditional models of learning in higher education, and I'm predicting that we're going to see a shift to an apprenticeship model, and not the apprentices of the Middle Ages times, but really people yearning to learn by doing. And again, this is another signal in the landscape of the human quotient uh, to really lean in and away from a stage on stage model to working more collaboratively and to working much more experientially. Speaking of great TV, I also happen to love the television show Billions. And this is an image of the character Wendy Rhodes. And Wendy on the show Billions, uh, her character is a um, really smart, savvy uh, corporate psychologist, and she's a psychologist who's on the C-suite of a really um, ag aggressive, testosterone-driven venture capital firm called Axe Capital. And what I thought was interesting about this uh, character is that she plays a really pivotal role in the working lives of people who you know work up, who wake up every day to make a lot of money and to try to, be to beat the market. But she's there to recenter them, to remind them about the power of visualization and meditation and being in touch with their inner child. Once again, a signal on the landscape really highlighting the value of the human quotient. Net net, what all of this is, is saying to me um, is that soft skills are not some woo woo out there second thought sort of thing. Soft skills are actually quite hardcore. And what are soft skills, the, the so-called soft skills? Soft skills are our ability to practice empathy, to have really active listening, to be collaborative, 
to be in, to be able to intuit the needs of others and our colleagues to be able to be nimble in a team situation and to be able to anticipate change, not only by the quantitative data and the charts and the graphs, but to be really great sense makers, to get out of the building, which is something I talked about last week in the design thinking webinar and understand the problems we're trying to solve from the perspective of the people that we're trying to help. So, in any effort that we can in our organizations, in our educational systems, really up the ante on soft skills, do more of that. And creativity is one way to do that, um, especially because we are trying to survive in these VUCA environments that are volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Uh, that sort of VUCA environment is nothing new. Uh, I, I, I see my chum, Chrissy McMinimum, is also on this call. Chrissy and I met a few years ago in China working with um, a, an entrepreneurship boot camp and one of my former um, mentees, uh, Vitaly from Russia, is on this webinar as well. Uh, Chrissy and I reconnected in Doha, Qatar this January. And being in the Middle East, was one more reminder to me of how ancient complexity is. When you're in that part of the world, you really get a sense of how old the world civilization is and how long people have been trying to hack complex problems. Um, complexity is just taking on a different shape and a different tone today. So our cities are also incredibly complex landscapes and environments that we have to learn how to navigate. What I'm ultimately proposing is that we've got to navigate and manage complexity with complexity. And creativity is the way to do that. Um, what do I mean by navigate and manage complexity with complexity? What, what, where, what was I thinking with, with, with making that kind of statement? Well, if I may, this is really one of the, the metaphors that, ca that came to me to try to explain this a little better. If you've ever been walking down the street and you step into a wad of chewing gum, What's the best way to get rid of that chewing gum? It's by taking more chewing gum and, and, and unsticking that chewing gum. That's the similar sort of, of tactic we need to use to navigate and manage complexity, right? We've got, it, we've got to attack it and, and um, find our way through it with another complex system. And creativity is a complex system. So, Here's my first question, and I just, I'm gonna apologize in advance. I just realized I misnumbered these questions. So you can ignore uh, the question numbers that are gonna come up. I'll fix them in the, in the deck that I, I share later. But anyway, um, my first question that I'm really curious to hear from you, because you're gonna hear my definition in a moment. Um, how do you define creativity? So if we could, um, let me see if I can stop share for a moment ask you to jot down your answers in the uh, chat area. area. Mm -hmm. And Christopher's going to read out. Some yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. A system of responses that goes beyond cognition. The ability to come up with new ideas or new ways base of applying existing ideas, thinking outside of the box to solve a problem, imagination, empathy, value creation, ability to find problems worth solving and solve them in creative ways. Okay, they are coming in. Nice. Ability to see outside the limits that we have set believe about ourselves from Fred Kingley. Creativity is the ability to apply innovative ways to solve problems. Creativity is color and energy. Creativity is a strategic and novel way to solve problems. Make something out of nothing using a multifaceted modalities. The ability to solve complex problems that do not have readily available or apparent solutions. Okay. Staying curious, seeing what no one else sees. I love these. These are awesome. Yeah, these are good. See what no one else sees. Making up a new story. Nice. Breaking down a problem into small units and fixing it. 
All right. Awesome. Love that, here. everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, we're going to try to, Christopher and I will try to save this chat and we'd love to share out some of these responses later in social media because I love the ways you guys are thinking about this. So here, here's, here's, an, here's an, one al alternative way um, that I've been thinking about creativity as well. Um, one of the things I think is so fascinating is that um, not, not, you know, present company excluded, of course, but often when people think about uh, creativity, uh, the images that may come to mind are a painter at her easel, you know, in this kind of bucolic environment, um, you know, painting away and in her, in her own world, right? Maybe another image of creativity are musicians jamming it out, right? And um, sometimes for those of us who, if you don't play a musical instrument or, you, or you're, you have incredible stage fright, you might think, oh, that's not for me. I certainly am not creative if that's how you've been thinking about creativity. Maybe you think about creativity, maybe the image that comes to your mind are incredibly trained dancers on stage who are able to tell stories uh, through movement in ways that um, takes a lot of years of, of training and, and also talent. So in my upcoming book, which is called The Creativity Leap, Unleash Curiosity, Improvisation, and Intuition at Work, I have really uh, done a deep dive into this question and I was really interested in going beyond those more traditional ways of what I would say where we've kind of ghettoized creativity in the arts, which I don't think is particularly fair to artists. And I don't think it's very beneficial to our society, society at large. So I was really interested in kind of democratizing how we're defining creativity, opening it up a bit, and hearing just as we heard just now from you all, how a range of, of other people from law and science and aerospace and farming and baking um, are looking at something like creativity. And that book comes out in June, FYI. Uh, for advanced sale right now on Amazon. So this is how I define creativity. Um, at the end of the day, I think creativity is our ability to toggle between wonder and rigor to solve problems and create novel value. That's, that's what I, I think at the end of the day, that's really what we're doing. Whether you're talking about telling a better story, seeing things through a different lens, um, problem, problem solving, inventing something that was not there before, it's this ability to be adaptive and agile in our minds and where we find inspiration and insight. And we need both wonder and rigor. You know, some of the things that are kind of unfair about those people who might silo creativity as only being the domain of artists is that um, they make it this magical, um, inaccessible space. Uh, you know, to be creative is not to pull something randomly out of your armpit, right? <laughs> Creativity requires incredible amounts of rigor. And it also requires that we design space and time for wonder. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a little bit more about that. So these are just a few images of some of the people I interviewed for the book. Um, this couple on the left, this is, this is uh, Gary and Amy Mainoff who are farmers. They own a, a five acre fruit farm just outside of Philly. And they, they demonstrated to me that farmers are the original hackers, right? Because they are constantly trying to invent, reinvent, toggle between wonder and rigor to figure out how can they remain relevant to a market uh, and to a group of consumers that may not value the work that they do. Um, this woman in kind of the left center is Nicole Pittman. She's an attorney. She's a child advocate. Uh, she is the leading policymaker on um, uh, ch child sex offenders. And she, through my interview with her, demonstrated the role of empathy and curiosity and deep listening to get to really creative and new and inventive um, ways to connect, to connect two sides of the aisle in our political system and to connect really varying perspectives between you know, the families of victims and the families of offenders. Uh, the gentleman down here is um, from um, I'm so sorry, I'm just blanking on his name, but he is, he is the head of the studio at uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Center, sorry, NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. And one of the, the, the things, um, visiting the, the Jet Propulsion Lab at NASA 
really showed me is that organizations need an instigator. They need um, a role in the organization that will constantly be challenging them and prodding them and helping them to translate, getting out of their bubble, what they do um, in new ways so that it is compelling to a wide audience. Um, this gentleman in the black and white photo is John Harker. He is our family plumber. And uh, plumbers are incredibly poetic. I learned this from John that he has to do incredible amounts of visualization and improvisation in order to get his work done with a range of stakeholders from the electricians to the carpenters to the architect. Uh, the woman to the very right is Celine Barrel. She is a perfume, she's a nose from International Flavors and Fragrances. And she is constantly working between um, hardcore science and chemistry and intuition. And then the gentleman on the bottom right is Randy Swearer. He's a former colleague and he's now uh, a vice president of, of learning strategies at Autodesk. And he talked about the value and importance of cognitive diversity and thought diversity at Autodesk. So those are just, uh, just a sampling of some of the people I interviewed and talked to to really get a sense of how they toggle between wonder and rigor to solve problems. Uh, at the end of the day, creativity is a productivity play, and it's a competency that is not an option anymore. It's something that we absolutely must engage in, and we have to cultivate for the future of work for this fourth industrial revolution train, which has already left the station. So when I said a few slides back that creativity is a, is a complex system, and that we've got, to, we've got to navigate and solve for complexity with complexity. This is what I meant. Um, to geek out a little bit, um, creativity is a chaotic system. And a chaotic is a word that D. Hock made up. D. Hock was the founder of, uh, he was the first president of Visa Credit Card Company. And when he was asked by Visa to head up a, an organization that would be based on the virtual, the global virtual exchange of currency. Uh, he was a little flummoxed at first about how he was going to pull that off. And he was a big naturalist. He was walking through the woods one day and he thought to himself, why do we insist that our human organizations have to be made up of boxes and, boxes and arrows and kind of, you know, based on this linear system of management? And he thought, what if our human organizations, which are types of organisms, what if they could be designed in a way that we see in nature, that they could be built off of some amount of chaos and allow for some amount of chaos and also allow for some amount of order. And uh, he called such systems chaos. So we see chaotic systems in nature. Um, I went for an amazing walk in the woods yesterday at the end of the day and uh, was once again reminded of the orderly chaos and the way forests sprout up, right? So a sapling uh, sprouts up from the forest, from the grounds of the forest, and it's self-organizing, it's emergent, and it's adaptive. Similarly, the way our bodies heal, there's not this permission slip culture, but it's local, adaptive, emergent self-organizing that, that thrives off of both the chaos and the order. Keep in mind that chaos is not anarchy. Chaos is randomness. And order is not control. Order is structure and its boundaries. And for any of you who have been students of the arts, you're well aware, just as in the form of music like jazz, there's an incredible amount of order and structure, right? Jazz musicians must know music theory. Uh, they have to practice incessantly. The music composition might have a beginning, a middle, and end. That's the structure. And then there is the beauty, the magic that happens in the interstices of when, when they're jamming together. And that's the chaos. So I, I applied this idea of, of chaotic systems to creativity. And not surprisingly, what do you know, as it turns out, wonder and rigor, uh, they, this is also a chaotic system. This way of, that, that I, I, I'm... I'm um, inviting you to think about creativity. Um, I went as far as to develop a game, a card game around it. So if you want to play around with that, um, check it out on Amazon. I'd love to get your feedback on it. Um, I prototyped it with four different companies over a period of about two years. So I would love to, to hear your thoughts about it. But wonder and rigor is something that we can practice 
and we can cultivate because it is a competency. It is a chaotic system. Wonder is the chaos, rigor is the order. So now let's get back to, back to you for a little bit. Um, I define wonder as curiosity. It's about pretending, it's about dreaming and daydreaming, proposing and supposing. It's super emergent. It can be performative. And my experience shows that we're not designing in enough time and space and process for the wonder. Especially if you work, you know this very well, if you work in an organization where you're running from meeting to meeting to meeting, right? There's no time to pause. Something that I started doing, um, actually I started doing it when I decided to naively earn a PhD while working full time. During the times of writing, what I call writing sprints from a PhD, I, I started putting in five minute timing, timed breaks for daydreaming. So I would literally set my timer to just stare out the window. I happen to be an amazing daydreamer. I've been that way since I was about six years old in first grade. And uh, I just found it incredibly helpful to my work process to really make myself intentionally daydream. So, um, and I still do it. Uh, so uh, try it out yourself. But here's my question to you. Um, who are your wonder mentors? And in asking that, what I, I want you to think about are, who are the people you look up to who you think are really good at curiosity, at awe, at pausing? And I want you to just share your, your examples uh, in the chat box. You do not have to necessarily know these folks. These could be people that you admire, um, but let's just share out who are some of our wonder mentors. Natalie Nixon. Aw, thank Bill you. Bill Gates, Mary <laughs> Oxman, Tim Ferriss, my wife, that's nice. High compliment. Elon Musk. Brian Spellman's mother. Oh no, Sarah Dolly's mother. Brian Spellman's dad. Chrissy, would you share more? Who is Judith Wright? For, so if you don't know these people, what do you do? Massimo Batura. Joe Jacob. Neil Gaiman. George Washington Carver. Hey, right. Hannah, Claude Silver is in my book. She's the chief heart officer at VaynerMedia. She's awesome. Richard Branson. Uh, I'm friends with her sister, by the way. Nice. Yeah. Um, uh, Judith Wright, who, who runs the Wright Foundation for the Realization. Franklin, we, can't, we can't use yours. Sade, Ben Franklin, Judith Wright. Stage director Michael Schiarelli, uh -oh. Lynn Manuel Miranda, Rick Watson, Debbie Allen, love Debbie Allen, Hiroki Araki, manga artist, Christina Tozzi, Ingrid Fattel. This is a great exercise. Paul Robeson, Frank Machos, Joe Budden, Walt Disney. Yeah. So here's the thing. Um, so, sometimes when um, I once heard this from a panelist. I was I was listening to a panel that I was listening to, and I and I never forgot this advice. Um, it was a panel, I guess, about networking and mentoring. And and a, a member of the audience asked, "Well, what's the best way to be mentored?" Um, and one of the panelists said, "The one of the best ways to become mentored is to help that person, because if you think about it, if you keep showing up, if you offer your time to help." one day that person is going to turn around and say, you know, this person just shows up without asking and any little bit that I have to be helpful to them, I'm going to give and I'm going to share. So I'd love for you to take, you know, this list, your personal list, and maybe it's, it's these are aspirational uh, mentors, but what if you could carve out 15 minutes just to have a phone call with this person and ask them um, this question directly, how do they practice and exercise wonder? What are the things that they do in their day? If you can't, if you can't just call up Jimmy Fallon, who's on this list, I see, uh, maybe just start really researching their lives um, and, and see if you can get an inkling of what they're doing to up the, the ante and curiosity and pausing and dreaming. Um, what are the things that they do? So actually be really intentional about this. Okay, this was awesome. So 
I'm going to go back to slot my slide and um, I'm going to go to the next question, which is about this notion of rigor. Now, um, going back again to, to, to some, not all, but to some of my corporate clients, I, I really think that in a well-meaning way, some of them really do think that they are, they are being rigorous, right? By having lots of meetings, by having a rule book, um, by having SOPs, standard operating procedures. I'm not convinced that that's actually rigor because what that often leads to is that churn that I referred to earlier. Um, the way I'm defining rigor is that rigor is about practice, it's time on task, it's thorough, it's about critique and being able to receive critique. It's about showing up over and over and over again, that buoyancy that we all need, and particularly during these times. And it's about radical discipline. Um, so when we think about rigor in that way, um, some organizations, some of us in our personal lives, can, can I certainly can, can stretch a little bit more and making sure we're practicing rigor in that way. So, so wait for it. My next follow-up question is, who are your models and mentors for rigor? Who are your rigor mentors? So I'm gonna go back to um, the general view and ask you to share, uh, who are your rigor mentors? Oh, Ansel Adams, Kobe, nice. Natalie Nixon, coming up again. Winston <laughs> Churchill, Mo Cheeks, Questlove. Yeah, yeah, we got a second Kobe. <clears throat> General Bell, teacher at West Point, I like that. Phil Knight. Kevin Hart. Yeah, Serena, George Washington, Adam Grant, love him. It's right here. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, Obama's, Mary Perkins' father, Priya Parker. Absolutely. Oh, I can grab that one. <laughs> Priya Parker. That's one too. <laughs> yeah. Keep the books close. Spike Lee, love it. Lenny Kravitz, oh my God, I saw him recently at the Met. Putin, ugh. James Clear, love that. I got that book. Seth Godin, Ava DuVenny. Matt and CJ Walker. Lupe Fiasco. These are great. Again, this is very fun to see how you, when you open it up and kind of all the different versions of, um, of the rigor principle that people are applying in different ways. Sports is obviously um, an easy one. Um, the creative fields, um, but also um, the world of personal and professional development is, is obvious. It's really interesting to see, you know, what, what people are grabbing out. Yeah, this is great. This yeah. is great. So I would have, I would give you the same call to action, right? To be really intentional to, if you can't call them up on the phone and have a coffee with them to really research them some more and really understand uh, what were the conditions that they built in their lives and their days to make sure that they could uh, practice rigor, that they could um, dig deep into uncomfortable silence. Um, what I, one of the podcasts that I really enjoy is Hello Monday, which is a podcast by LinkedIn. And um, Jesse Hempel, who's the host, interviewed the actor uh, Laura Linney, who, by the way, is a co-star on another one of my favorite television shows right now, Ozark, which you definitely should check out if you have not yet. Um, but Laura Linney talked about how in her practice and work as an actor, how artists are particularly good at sitting with discomfort, at sitting with uncertainty and um, just kind of letting it dwell, not sugarcoating it, not running away from it because you can't, you got to work through it. In her case, she said, there's always a moment in a rehearsal series. As she said, I think she says around rehearsal number seven, where you get into the muck of the process of acting and theater. And it's not fun, it's not easy, um, but the rigor is really what pulls them through. So thank you for that, guys. Okay, so we're gonna go back to the deck. I think it's after this that I started to, to uh, misnumber my questions, but 
forgive me for that. Bear with me. All right. Yeah, you're um, so here are two corollaries that I think it's really important to remember. Wonder is found in the midst of rigor. Wonder is found in the midst of rigor. So if rigor is weeding the garden, uh, cleaning uh, the, the banister steers and the, and the woodwork, if it's um, doing your taxes, whatever the rigorous exercise it is, how many of those moments can you recall where you're in the middle of deep in the weeds where all of a sudden that light bulb moment comes up for you? Where all of a sudden that moment of inspiration happens? This is one of the reasons why it's so important to do that toggling. Our brains are designed so the neural synapses function in a much more electrified way when we let ourselves go deep um, through rigorous work. The second part, the, the corollary of that statement is that rigor can't be sustained without wonder. So going back again to sometimes in our work environments where we're churning, right? And we're trying to innovate, we're trying to build and design these cultures of innovation. Um, that's not gonna happen in a sustained and sustainable way unless we design in space and time and systems for wonder. So while a lot of the way I've been talking about creativity in this webinar is in a personal development perspective, in my work, we're really talking about designing systems of creativity because that ultimately is going to be the way our work environments can have sustained innovation. So just, just uh, keep in mind that those, those corollaries. So getting towards the end and want to hear some of your questions um, at, at the end of this webinar, but um, there's four leaps that I really encourage you to take in this fourth industrial revolution that will help you to um, lead with creativity. Um, the first leap is to not only dwell on the side of what's rational and rationality, but to also embrace ambiguity. And I could not, you know, unfortunately have timed this better. There's, there's no rational reason that we can find at this point in time why and how this pandemic has exploded in the way that it has. So when all rationale, we, when we have to leave that behind, it's the, it's the time to dwell in that ambiguity, which is, a, which is the, the, the crux of complexity. A complex system is different from a complicated system. A complicated system is, you know, if you open your, the, your wristwatch, open the face of your watch and you look at all the, the intricacies, a, a complicated situation, you have a clear way in and a clear way out. In complexity, there's no clear way in of how it started and there's certainly no clear way out. Um, so we have to use uh, three tactics, which I'm going to share in a moment to, to, to do that. We also have to make a leap from only embracing our tribes, which unfortunately in the United States has really led to a lot of, of separation, a lot of animosity, especially in our political environment right now. But we also have to leap towards community. Community at the end of the day consists of tribes, but we've got to embrace community. We've got to also leap away from just deep specialization. And as a former academic, I'm well aware of how much specialization is valued and rewarded. But in the future of work, you will be rewarded for your ability to be a polymath, to be a pie-shaped thinker, someone who is well-versed and um, has the ability. So someone, someone put up uh, George Washington as um, a, either a wonder mentor or a rigor mentor, uh, but Leonardo da Vinci, George Washington, they, these are people who were really adept and well-versed in the sciences, sciences and the arts and the arts of rhetoric, uh, politically savvy, that sort of thing. That's going to be uh, the, the domain as a polymath that will really take you far. And we've got to leap away from only leaning on the rule book to embracing a playbook. A playbook allows us to be super agile, to allow us to make decisions according to situations which are going to change according to um, the environment. So the three tactics I, I encourage you to start exercising to make these four leaps are, is to be more curious and to inquire is to be much more improvisational. And improvisation means that you are adaptive and that you can think on your feet and to intuit. Intuition is something that we don't talk a lot about. Uh, in our business schools, in our medical schools, we never touch on it. Yet let's take in the, in the area of business schools, 
every successful entrepreneur credits their intuition for their success. There's always a moment in their origin story where they will say, something told me not to do the deal. Something told me to work with her over him, right? And intuition is a type of pattern recognition. Um, I call this the three I creativity framework. Um, if we toggle again between inquiry, improvisation, and intuition, that gets us to insights. And that's the way we can practice wonder and rigor. Um, if you're not yet convinced, uh, I always like to leave people with the, the business ROI of being able to make creativity leaps. Number one, if you exercise creativity, especially as an organization, you will necessarily have to have more inventive thinking. And if you have more inventive thinking, you're gonna discover new business models, different strategic partnerships, and you'll unearth revenue streams that weren't there. We're seeing this right now in this environment, right? How many people from high-end restaurants to uh, my friend, Bria Moss Wilkerson, who I think is on this webinar, who is the founder of Dance Fit X, which is a dance studio here in Philly, have had to really quickly pivot and adapt to online offerings that have, that have you know, been uncomfortable to figure out in the short term, but longer term are gonna open up new revenue models and platforms for them to offer their services. Number two, the return on investment or the return on innovation by making a creativity leap is that you necessarily need a more collaborative organizational culture. If we are more collaborative, that means we're going to try to reduce or even eliminate silos. If we eliminate and reduce silos, we will improve our efficiencies. And if we improve our efficiencies, we will lower costs. If that's not a business ROI, I don't know what is. And thirdly, when we make these creativity leaps, we have to fall in love with our customers' problems. We become customer obsessed and customer centered in the products and services that we're selling. That leads to more sustained brand loyalty through the ups and downs of a business cycle. Um, so clearly this is not question number three, this is actually question number four, but um, I wanna leave you with two calls to action. Um, the first is this question. What is one thing that you can start doing tomorrow or this afternoon to begin exercising wonder? What's one thing that you can start to incorporate on a daily basis, on a weekly basis that will become a habit that will help you to exercise wonder? I'm gonna just skip to the next question really quickly because then we'll, we'll share the screen, I'll unshare the screen. What's one thing addition that you can start doing tomorrow, this afternoon to exercise rigor? to make sure that you do the darn thing, that you show up. Rigor is not necessarily fun, it's not sexy, it's often quite um, lonely, solitary work, but it's absolutely essential. So um, let's share some of our answers um, with that one. What's one that you can start doing tomorrow to exercise wonder and to exercise rigor? Oh, I love this. Mm. Making time in the woods or by the ocean. Unstructured, unscheduled time to daydream, which Natalie said she does frequently. More time in the woods or the ocean, letting my mind wander. Sounds like a Beatles song, drawing, journaling, walk in the woods, be outside. I'm right-handed, so do stuff with my left hand. So I think about it, interesting. Pay attention on my walk with my dogs, that's a good one. Don't, don't put, that, put that phone away. Four day work week, back here somewhere. <laughs> Another book. <laughs> Interpretive dancing, which Natalie also does. Yep. Meditation. Freestyling. Uh-oh, turn on that mic. <laughs> New tools and methods to move 130,000 students and 9,000 teachers to online learning. I hope that's the city, the school district of Philadelphia. I got a senior in high school who's got too much time on his hands right now. Burpees, ouch, read, <laughs> appreciate more. Nice. Play chess with my son. Nice. All right. Awesome, thank you, thank you, thank you. These are outstanding. So um, to conclude, and then let's go to, if anyone has a question or two, uh, we'll, we'll have, make some time for a couple of questions. Um, here's my contribution to this conversation. Three things you can start doing um, pretty immediately 
to be more curious in your work environments and your and your work webinar meetings are, that we're going to have quite a, a few of in the upcoming weeks, um, maybe months, is to insist on creative abrasion teams. Creative abrasion is a term that the, the former head of design for Nissan, the, the automotive company, um, made up. And he, and he insisted that whenever his design team was working on a design challenge for a car, he made sure there were people from sales and manufacturing and operations and finance also involved in that process. His perspective is that while abrasion can lead to friction, and friction is something that's uncomfortable for us, Ultimately, friction produces energy. So he said, let's flip the paradigm on abrasion and friction. Let's convert that energy to something really positive. Because now these are my words, not, not Jerry Hirschberg's, but in my view, the more diverse the inputs, the more innovative the output. So absolutely in, insist on creative abrasion. The other thing that, that making teams that are cognitively diverse like this will, ha will, will do is that it will make you more curious, right? If you come from a manufacturing and all of a sudden you, 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 you have people from finance or design working on, on, on a problem with you, you have to lean in a bit more and, and ask different questions to understand why they frame things that way, why they're, why they're thinking about going about the problem in that way. It also will, will help you to become more of a translator of your own work. Secondly, um, to be more improvisation, be, improvisational, become a clumsy student at something. So while I've studied dance for many, many years, um, I've recently become a student of the Foxtrot, um, and I've re-embraced salsa and tango. And let me tell you, I'm not great at it. Uh, I often feel stupid. Um, I'm constantly asking questions. I have to be super present, really adaptive. I get all these amazing life lessons from my dance teacher um, at Society Hill Dance, such as slow down or um, you've got to follow me, right? You, you, you will mess it up if you try to lead. So when you become a clumsy student of something, there's something that shifts in the way your mind is working and thinking about challenges in front of you that you will transfer into your work. And, and third, start really becoming an ardent observer about how much you pay attention to your intuition. I recommend that you journal and document intuitive choices that you've made. So start by just documenting three times you followed that nudge in your heart to go left instead of right, to um, not date or not date person X, Y, Z, right? What was the result of that? Um, and when you didn't follow that nudge, it start, it's really important to hone our intuition as if it's a muscle or a sonar, because it is. Um, gotta end with this quote from the jazz bassist, Charlie Mingus who uh, was known to have said that making the simple complicated is commonplace. Making the complicated simple, awesomely simple, that's creativity. So here's to more simplicity, here's to more wonder and to more rigor. Thank you so much, guys. Um, as Christopher said, we will be sharing uh, the slide deck with everyone who registered. We will be sharing the, re the recording of this webinar um, you can please follow me and Christopher through our social media. Christopher is at Kismet Cowork. I am at NetWNixon. Uh, definitely subscribe to the YouTube channel I've created so you can get access to more of these sorts of videos. And let's see if there's a one or two um, final questions. There, 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 um, when you said creative abrasion, um, Team of Rivals, I don't know if you're familiar with that book. That's a really interesting idea of creative abrasion. And there was a question here that says, is um, rigor just focus? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I'm, I'm pausing because rigor often leads to um, what I call following the breadcrumbs. It leads to when you're really intensely working on one thing, um, it leads to something else. So that's the exploration part that I think can come from rigor. So that's a great question. Um, yeah, creative abrasion, radical collaboration, but love the abrasion because it implies exploratory over confirmatory thinking. And I like that. Yeah, exploratory over confirmatory. That's, that's a, a, a really good one. Nice. How can I better quantify my soft skills? Hmm. Well, um, 
first, I, so, so, so I, I will say that I think in the best of situations in, in working through a challenge, we're integrating both quantitative and qualitative methods to work. But if you want, if you're thinking about quantifying your soft skills, first ask yourself, why do you want to do that? Right? What's the purpose? What's the outcome that you, you want to do? But, but you know, one thing is, is to document. So, so if, the, if the soft skill, if it's important for you to, to quantify how empathic you are, um, it's to be much more mindful and intentional of, you know, maybe the, the amount of times that you have done that. And if you geek out with charts and graphs, you can start to plot that out over time. That's just one example. I haven't, I have to admit, I haven't given a ton of, of thought to that. Um, but I think it's a really good question. And I'd love to hear um, your, your ideas about that in ways that you've tried to quantify soft skills. Uh, Natalie, um, I just wanted to point out that Natalie is offering a 15 minute um, connection with anybody who is on this call who would like to talk to her in person. And uh, we will be sharing the Calendly um, um, invitation to do that. Uh, Natalie, where would somebody get the, um, the the card game? Is that available? Oh, yes, it is. Thanks so much for asking. It would be a fun thing to play on the internet with your friends. You could order it decks for your Yeah, friends. do it. It's, 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 it's available on Amazon. You type in the words Wonder Rigor, all one word, and it will come up. I don't think it will come if you do Wonder Space Rigor, but I don't know. But it's Wonder Rigor. It's for sale right now on Amazon. Would love your feedback on the game. We'd love to hear back from some of you how you're how you're playing it virtually too. Thanks for that. Okay, and um, so we're two fifty eight. We have one, time for one more question, um, and that says, "How do you focus your moments of wonder so you can solve the problem at hand and not lead your thinking towards another one?" Um, timers are my best friend. So um, yeah, I'll say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's, the, she's the axe woman with the timer. That, that's kind of true. Uh, but for myself as well, because I am a mighty daydreamer. I love to daydream, but um, it, that, that for me is the way you do it. If, if, you're, if you're going to practice uh, your wonder through walking um, and making sure that you kind of corral it in, you know, give it limits. That's the chaoticness of it, right? You need to create some boundaries for it. And it's actually, I always like to also say, I didn't have that slide in this deck, but creativity loves constraints constraints of time, constraints of financial resources, constraints of people talent. That's when all of our best work uh, bubbles to the top uh, through that funneling process, that, that pressure cooking process. Oh, thank you, Bria. She posted the link on Amazon if you wanna get uh, the, the deck of Wonder Rigger cards. Thanks so much. So, okay, well, we'll be sharing everything. Thank you everybody for coming. And um, like Natalie said, feel free to tag us on social media at Kismet Cowork and Figure Eight, Natalie Nixon and Christopher Plant. And um, obviously, um, I think I've had a blast doing this with you, Natalie. These two uh, webinars were super fantastic, and I hope that it's just the beginning of a bunch of creative programming that we um, are going to put out into the world, not just for this this brief moment when we're all stuck at our at our desk, <laughs> but. Um, but, but in the future, because I think that these conversations about some of the less obvious um, pathways to pro productivity are really important to have and, and certainly um, important to share in this incredibly weird time. Um, <laughs> there is going to be a lot of um, re re redefining, repositioning, you know, reprogramming and, um, and um, you know, so it's, it's, it's going to be interesting. So thank you very much, Natalie. And thank you everybody for coming. And thank um, you everyone. Thank you so much, Christopher, for your collaboration and partnership. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Take okay, care. Bye. bye. Right, bye. Meeting over.